Hello everybody. I am Rangin Pallav Tripathi. I am an assistant professor of law at National Law University, Odessa. And today, in the paper of advanced jurisprudence, I will be speaking to you in relation to the module of Hoffel's analysis of power liability relations. Since 1913, when the first article of Hoffel was published regarding his analysis of dual relations, there has been much literature, much debate, much praise and much criticism regarding his scheme of analysis. His analysis has presented both the students of the law and the practitioners of the law with an understanding through which they can appreciate the way in which law operates better and they can also apply the law in a much better manner. The totality of Hoffer's scheme is large. So today we will be focusing primarily on the power liability relations proposed by Hoffelt. The objectives of this particular module are the following. To understand the purposive character of law, to understand the mechanism of legal relations through which law operates, through which law seeks to achieve its purpose. To appreciate the context and the meaning of power liability legal relation proposed by Hoffelt. To understand the difference between power liability relation on one hand and right duty relation on the other hand. To understand the concurrent legal relation of power with duty and power with privilege. To appreciate the idea of disability and immunity in terms of the constituent of power. And to evaluate some of the criticisms which have been directed at Hoffelt. Law does not arise out of a vacuum. Law does not appear out of thin air. Law is an instrumentality created by deliberate human action. It doesn't happen accidentally. It doesn't happen on its own. Man consciously, deliberately organizes itself into a particular governance structure and creates law, modifies law, repeals law. The minute we understand that law is a conscious human creation. It is but obvious that it needs to have a purpose. If we are doing something deliberately, if we are taking so much of pain to create something, then we are creating it not casually. We are creating the definite purpose in our mind. Now, the purpose might be varied. The purposes might be different. In some laws, the purpose might be to discriminate against women. In some laws, equality might be the purpose. But the universal fact is that every law and legal system has some purpose for which law comes into existence. Once we know that law has a purpose, the next question is, how will law achieve that purpose? As I have said earlier, the purposes of law might be different, but the modality through which law achieves its purpose is common to all. That is the mechanism of legal relations. Legal relations can be plainly put as the relationship between two entities determined by a rule of law. It is this creation of legal relations, modification of legal relations, elimination of legal relations through which law achieves its objectives. Let's take an example. The preamble to the Constitution of India proclaims equality of opportunity as one of the fundamental objectives of our Constitution. Mentioned in the preamble, which has been recognized by the Supreme Court of India as the vision document of our Constitution, it sets forth the purposes for which the Constitution of India was promulgated. Now, equality of opportunity has now been recognized as an purpose. But how will the constitution achieve that purpose? One of the provisions of the constitution through which the purpose is achieved is article 16 clause 2, which creates a legal relation between citizens seeking employment under the state and appointing authority of the state on the other hand. It prohibits the state from discriminating on the grounds of religion, race, caste and so on 
in matters of public appointment. So, every citizen of India who is seeking a public appointment in the state is given an immunity. And every appointing authority under the state is given a disability, that is, the absence of power to discriminate. If they had the power to discriminate, it would be power to discriminate. But in this case, they have been given, they have been told that they do not have the power to discriminate. This relationship of disability on the part of the state and immunity on the part of the citizens creates a legal relation between the state and the citizen, which, as we see, achieves the purpose of ensuring that equality of opportunity prevails. The most popular, the most obvious legal relation through which law operates is right and duty. And most of human history is dedicated to the analysis of right and duty only. But one of the primary tasks which Hoffel accomplished was to distinguish right duty relations from other relations. He contended that all legal relations cannot be characterized as right and duty. There are different types of legal relations through which law seeks to achieve its purpose. Hoffel's basic scheme of jural relations was of two types, jural opposites and jural correlatives. Jural opposites refer to right and no right, right and no right are jural opposites, privilege and duty are jural opposites, power and disability are jural opposites, immunity and liability are jural opposites. And jural correlatives refer to right and duty, privilege and no right, power and liability, immunity and disability. Jural correlatives refers to a scenario where if X is vested with one, Y is necessarily vested with another. For example, if X has a right to collect rent from Y, then Y definitely has a duty to pay rent to X. Correlatives mean that if one element is present in X, for its fulfillment, the other element needs to be present in Y. So if there is an privilege in X, there will be a no right in Y. If there is a right in X, there will be a duty in Y. If there is a power in X, there will be a liability in Y. If there is an immunity in X, there will be a disability in Y. We can go back to our earlier example of Article 16.2, that is, when the citizens have immunity from discrimination, the state has a disability in relation to discrimination. Jural opposites, on the other hand, refer to a scenario where the elements which are identified as jural, jural opposites cannot exist in the same individual at the same time, which means if X has a right at the same time in relation to the same thing, he cannot have a no right. If X has a power in relation to a thing, at the same time it cannot be said that he has a disability in relation to thing. Let us consider an example. If X has the power to make a will, then at the same time it cannot be contended that X has a disability to make the will. That is, dual opposites refer to those set of elements which cannot exist in relation to the same thing in the same individual at the same time. They might exist in relation to different things. For example, X has a right to, X has a power to make a will, but he does not have a power to imprison Y. So at the same time, he has a power to make a will and he has a disability to imprison Y. But we have to understand here that this power and disability are coexisting in relation to different things. The power is in relation to making of the will. The disability is in relation to imprisoning Y. Now, the power liability dimensions proclaimed by Hoffeld refer to power and liability as jural correlatives, power and disability as jural opposites. We have to understand here the difference between legal meaning of a term and non-legal meaning of a term on which Hoffeld spent considerable energy and time. That is, every term that we use can have a non-legal meaning, can have a regular meaning in which it is used generally in the society. But when we speak of law, we need to understand every term in the context of law alone. Power, seen generally, might refer to physical power, 
might refer to the physical might of a person, might refer to economic power as well. But we have to understand power not in its physical sense, not in its economic sense, but in its legal sense. Now to explain power in its legal sense, Hoffeld referred to the idea of legal relations being altered. According to him, legal relations can be altered in different ways. One is when legal relations are altered for factors which are beyond the human control. For example, I have the right to sell a particular good. That good gets burned. It is something which is not in my control. But I have lost my right. I no longer have a right to sell something. Then rights, duties or other legal relations are created, are altered at times for factors which were within human control. So when the legal relations of X can be altered by Y, alteration will mean creation of a new legal relation, alteration or modification of an existing relation, extinguishing an existing legal relation, it can mean any number of things. If X's legal relation can be controlled by Y, then it is said that Y has the power over X. So power is nothing but the ability to impact legal relations of another individual. The most obvious example is, suppose I am the owner of a particular thing. So when I sell that thing, I have the power to make another person the owner of a particular thing. So before me exercising my power of selling it, the other person did not have a right over that goods. But that right is created when I sell the thing. So when Y has a power over X, X is liable towards Y. This relation is known as power liability relation. That is, when X is subject to the power of Y, Y is said to have power and X is subject sub to have liability. Now here also the term liability has to be understood not as a negative connotation. Generally when we talk of liability, it means something negative. Here it means only one thing, that X's legal relations are liable to be altered by Y, either for the better or for the worse. For example, when Y gifts something to X, X is deriving a benefit and he is still under a liability. So liability does not have necessarily a negative connotation. Once we understand power liability relation, we need to understand that it is significantly different from a right duty relation. When I have a power to do something, the other person does not have a duty, he has a liability. And that is where power is different from right. Because a right can exist only when there is a correlative duty for that right. If another person does not have a duty towards me, I cannot be having a right. What I have may be something else, but it cannot be called right in the proper sense of the term as explained by Hoffelt. Power means that somebody else has a liability. Liability means it is possible that a duty might be created when I change his legal relations. A duty might be extend, extinguished when I change his legal relations. But he does not have a duty per se. To illustrate this point, Hoffeld referred to a case of Booth versus Commonwealth. In this case, a particular Virginia statute contained the following and I am quoting verbatim that all free white male persons who are 21 years of age and not over 60 shall be liable to serve as jurors except as hereinafter provided. Here is a case where all white males over 21 years of age do not have a duty to be jurors. They have a liability to be jurors. The minute they are called to be jurors, they will have a duty. But until that point, all that they have is a liability, a potential to become a juror. They do not have a duty to be a juror. Power liability liability relation is essentially something which carries a potential. It can create a duty. It can extinguish a right. It can create a right. It does not necessarily mean that the person has a right 
or has a duty at that point of time itself. Unless the power is exercised, legal relations are not changed. Power is the ability to change legal relations. It is not changing legal relations per se. If I do not exercise the power, legal relations will not change. For example, if a white male of 21 years of age, in the above example, is never called to be a juror, which means in relation to him the power was never exercised and he will never have a duty to become a juror. So power liability relation refers to a potential, refers to an ability. Exercise is another question. Same example can be taken in relation to the constitution of India as well. The parliament has a power to impose excise duty on tobacco manufacturers. This is a power and the tobacco manufacturers will be liable under the power if the power is exercised. If tomorrow the parliament makes a law and says that tobacco manufacturers will have to pay this much of excise duty, then they will have a duty to pay excise duty. Unless the power is exercised, there is only a liability to have a duty created. There is no duty which is existent. Existence of a duty is what defines a right duty relationship. So a power might create a right duty relationship, but a power is not in itself a right duty relationship. We also have to understand that these squares of Hoffel's scheme of legal relations do not operate in isolation. Power is not simply connected with liability or disability. Power is also connected with duty and privilege. That is, the legal relations are not compartmentalized. Power is the ability to affect another person's legal relations. Now, that is the ability. Whether I am free to exercise that ability in the manner that I want to exercise, or whether I am duty bound to exercise that power in a particular manner, that is another question. So at times what might happen is that I have a power which I have a privilege to exercise. How I exercise that power is up to me. On some other occasions, I might have a power which I have a duty to exercise. That is, I do not have a discretion as to how I am going to exercise that power or also as to whether I am going to exercise that power. So power can be coupled with both privilege or duty. For example, let us first consider power with privilege. Article 15 clause 3 of the constitution of India enables the state to make special provisions for women and children. Now this is the power vested in the state. If under that power the state creates certain rights for women and children then those rights will be created. But the state is not bound to exercise that power. The state may exercise it, the state may not exercise it. If the state chooses to exercise it, that is, the state decides to exercise it, nobody can stop the state. But at the same time, nobody can compel the state to exercise it as well. It is a choice on the part of the state. Same way, Article 21A enables the state to provide free and compulsory education to children between the ages of 6 and 14. In this situation, the state has a power to vest rights in children by launching a program by which free and compulsory education can be provided. Now what has to be seen is that unlike article 15 clause 3, the state does not have a discretion as to whether it can provide free and compulsory education or not. The state has a discretion under that article to decide the modality with which it will provide the education, but it is duty bound to provide free and compulsory education to all children between the ages of 6 and 14. So this is an example where the state has been given a power to alter legal relations and in relation to that power, the state has a duty to exercise that power. Now when we speak of power liability relationship, it will be incomplete to speak of it unless we briefly understand what is immunity disability relationship. Power liability relationship is contrasted by immunity disability relationship. The opposite of power is disability and the opposite of liability is immunity. The way power refers to the existence of an ability to alter legal relations, disability refers to the absence of an ability to alter legal relations and 
the correlative of disability is immunity that is when y had a power to alter the legal relation of x y had a power x had a liability when y does not have the power to alter the legal relation of x x has a disability y has an immunity best example article 162 which we already discussed that is state is given a disability state is told that it does not have a power to do something as a correlative of the disability every individual every citizen under the state has been vested with an immunity against any such power again disability immunity relationship also has to be distinguished from right duty relationship if the state had a duty not to discriminate then any attempt by the state would be prohibited but disability primarily means that the state might try to discriminate but all its actions which are founded on a discrimination will not have any legal validity immunity does not create a duty on the part of the state immunity in citizens creates a disability in the part of the state meaning they don't have the power they don't have a duty that is the proposition is not that they will never try to discriminate they might try it is not prohibited from them to discriminate but if they try such attempts will not bear any fruit it will lack any legal validity or legitimacy if the immunity vested in the citizens were a co right in the strict sense of the term then there would be correlative duty imposed on the state which is not the case now like all political philosophers like all jurists Hoffel's scheme of jural relations Hoffel's analysis of jural relations is not free from criticism it's not that his propositions have been accepted without dispute without question there has been much criticism and equally vigorous clarifications and support in favor of Hoffelt. Now, because this module is in relation to power liability relationships, we will not be focusing on criticism which is directed at other parts of Hoffelt's theory. Our focus is primarily on such criticism which is primarily directed towards the power liability relationship contempt contemplated by Hoffelt. And in this relation, we will be referring mainly to the criticisms made by Halpin. In order to understand the criticism made by Halpin against the power liability relations contemplated by Hoffeld, we first need to understand some preliminary points which Halpin is trying to make. According to him, the idea of opposites, dual opposites as uh, mentioned by Hoffeld, is not a single idea. He gives the example of a person sitting across the table. When I am on the one side of table, the person who is sitting across the table may be directly opposite to me, may also be diagonally opposite to me. So according to him, the way the idea of opposite is different here. The idea of dual opposites can also not be a single idea. There may be different kinds of opposites. The best example that he gives is the singular idea being fresh vegetables. Now this idea of fresh can have different kinds of opposites. Two, suggest a contradictory idea to fresh vegetables we may call it stale vegetables we may call it non-fresh vegetables we may also call it frozen vegetables so according to him opposite is of three kinds opposite of negation opposite of extreme and opposite of alternative so when we look at the term fresh not fresh is an opposite of negation stale is an opposite of extreme and frozen is an opposite of frozen, opposite of alternative. Now, according to Halpin, the term privilege by Hoffel is not consistent. At times, it has been used as an opposite of negation. At times, it has been used as an opposite of extreme. And he does not use the idea of dual opposite consistently across his theory. And According to Halpin, the idea of privilege can be broken down to rights and duties. And because it can be broken down to rights and duties, it is not an independent conception. Because one of the 
fundamental things about Hoffel's scheme of dual relations is that privilege is different from right, power is different from immunity and that is why these sets of legal relations have been created. If it can be shown that they are not different but they are the same, then the whole structure proposed by Hoffel falls apart. Once we have understood this, we can come to the direct criticism made by Hoffel against the power liability relation proposed by of Halpin proposed by Hoffel. The primary problem that Halpin has against the proposition of power is that it can be expressed in terms of a privilege and because it can be expressed in terms of a privilege, it is not a separate element, it cannot be a separate legal relation. He gives the example of B having made an offer to A in contract. Now, if B has already made an offer to A, then it is said that A has the power to impose a contractual obligation on himself, on B. He has the power to create contractual rights for himself, for B. Now, this is a power. And this power is triggered when A accepts the offer of B by posting the letter of acceptance. According to Halpin, this power to accept and create contractual obligation can be broken down to two constituents. Constituent one is that a permission by law to do an act, that is A has been given the permission by law to accept the offer of B. According to Halpin, such a permission amounts to a privilege. And second, the potential legal relation dependent on the doing of the permitted act. That is, he is saying that the power to post a letter of acceptance is two type, can be broken down to two elements. First, the permission by law to post a letter of acceptance. Second, the consequences of posting the letter of acceptance. Now, his conception is that this first permission by the law by which A is permitted to post a letter of acceptance is but a privilege. And if it is a privilege, power cannot be an independent element. This criticism is unfair because the criticism is based on a misplaced understanding of what Hoffel is meaning by power. Whether I have a permission to do something or not is not connected with the nature of the act in question. Meaning, whether something is a power or not is dependent on whether it has the potential to alter legal relations or not. Whether a permission has, per person has the permission to do an act or a compulsion to do an act is separate from the considerations involved in judging the nature of the act. As we have seen earlier, in relation to a power, I might have a freedom to do the act, that is a privilege to do the act, and I might have a duty to do, do the act. Whether I have a power or not is dependent entirely on the nature of the act. Is it an act which is capable of altering legal relations or is it an act not capable of altering legal relations? When Hoffel defines power, he is not taking this first constituent into the definition of power at all. A might have a permission to do something, A might have a duty to do something. Whether he has power or not depends on the doing of that thing, whether it involves altering of legal relations or does not involve altering of legal relations. The best way to look at it is to understand that I might have a privilege which does not alter legal relations at all. I am singing in the bathroom, I am singing in my bedroom, I am exercising a privilege which does not affect anybody's legal relation. So, these two constituents which Halpin is identifying, we have to understand the first of those constituents was never put forth by Hoffeld as ingredient of power. Whether a particular situation person has power or not depends entirely on the nature of the act. 
does not depend on whether that person has the permission to do the act or does not have the permission to do the act. When we define power, we will not consider whether he has the permission to do it or duty to do it. He might have the permission to exercise a power, he might have a duty to exercise a power. The definition of power is not dependent on whether he has the permission or he has a duty. The second criticism leveled by Halpin against Hoffeld is that power liability relationship cannot be a bipartite relation. It can never be between A and B alone. He gives an example. He says that when A has the right to vest a legal estate in land, that is, let's say A has the right to make B the owner of a particular land. The legal relations affected hereby are not simply that of A or B. It's not that A's rights over the land are gone and B's rights over the land are being created. It doesn't end there. Because B is the owner of the land now, X, Y, Z and all of the people have duties not to enter the land. Because it is the land of B, the way X, Y, Z had a duty not to trespass the land of A, the same way they have a duty not to trespass the land of B. So earlier they had a duty towards A, now they have a duty towards B. So the exercise of a power affects not simply two persons or two sets of parties, it affects many parties. So to express power liability relation only between X and Y or only between A and B according to Halpin is insufficient. It does not cover according to Halpin the totality of the correlative spectrum. Again here we have to understand that Halpin has misunderstood the point being made by Hoffeld. It is true that when A has the power to alter the legal relation of B, it need not be the legal relation between B and A which is being altered. A might have the power to alter the legal relation of B vis-a-vis -vis B and X, B and Y, B and Z or B and X, Y, Z all put together. So the power is never supposed to be between only the power holder and though that person who is liable under that particular power. But what has to be understood here is that X, Y and Z are not liable to the power of A in the same sense that B is. A definitely affects their legal relations but only through B. The primary liability is that of B. Suppose A cannot create a duty in X, Y, Z on his own without altering the legal relation of B. So the primary legal relation is between A and B. Because B's legal relation is being altered, it might impact other persons also. That doesn't mean they become liable towards A. When we summarize, we can see that law is primarily a purposive mechanism. The purposes could be different, but law exists to fulfill a purpose. And it fulfills this purpose primarily through the mechanism of legal relations. It creates legal relations between different persons to ensure that its objectives are fulfilled. Now the most categorical, the most seminal analysis of these jural relations have been made by Hoffeld in 1913 and in the second article that came in 1917. And one of the most important part of this scheme of legal relations or jural relations is power liability relation which is as we saw significantly different from a right duty relation. We also see that power does not operate in isolation. It's not that a person simply has a power. In relation to the power he might have a privilege as to how to exercise that power. He might also have a duty as to how to exercise that power or when to exercise that power. Power primarily refers to the ability to affect legal relations in a multitude of ways and liability is not a negative connotation. Liability can also mean that I am liable to be benefited. Halpin's criticism of Hoffeld is based on a misplaced understanding of what Hoffeld means by power. Hoffeld never includes the permission part to do an act in his definition of power. His definition of power is entirely based on what is the nature of the act in question. And though 
Much criticism has been leveled against Hoffeld over the period of time. We need to acknowledge that 101 years after he proposed a scheme of dual relations, it is still a valuable tool to understand the law. It is still a valuable tool to understand how law operates. It is as relevant today as it was ever in the course of history. Thank you.